All right, so welcome to Restart, where we are breaking down the craziness of today and making it relatable to you. Today, we have a special guest joining us. It's going to take me a couple breaths to get all this out, but he is a New York-based Emmy Award-winning television and radio broadcaster, Ryan Rucco. He's a play-by-play announcer for the NBA, the WNBA on ESPN, the New York Yankees, and the Brooklyn Nets on the Yes Network, and even boxing on DAZN. On top of that, Ryan hosts a podcast with CC Sabathia called R2C2. Holy smokes, this guy has done it all at just the mere age of 33 years old. So Ryan, thank you so much for being here with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Jason. I appreciate it, dude. Yeah. So before we get into, you know, your life path and, and your career and, and what we're going to dive into, some of the hurdles you've overcome and where you are today, you know, I, I know we're in quarantine and you actually had a wedding planned June 13th and you're in New York City, the, the mecca of it all. So how is everything going in your world with the quarantine? It's, it's been wild, man. I mean, you know, I have been tracking this very closely because my wedding is in June and it's in yeah. Italy. So like when I saw, you know, the way things started to develop in Italy, I, you know, I was following very closely and, you know, started to just get the feeling like, oh, wait, no, we're going to experience the same exact thing here. You know, yeah. and, and I even um, as I was traveling around the country, the first couple of weeks of March doing NBA games, Yankee spring training, I was starting to feel anxious knowing that, you know, this is we're probably behind on how we're addressing it. Sure. Uh, and, and most of my thought was about the, the wedding as far as how it was directly affecting my life, you know? Um, and people starting to get worried, thinking of it as an Italian problem, not necessarily a global one. Um, and, uh, and, you know, then obviously it enveloped the entire world. And so, you know, whereas our wedding was the focus before, now we sort yeah. of just accept it as collateral damage to a much bigger problem, you know? So it sucks uh, because yeah. you know, we were, we, we've been engaged for a year and a half. We were in the stretch run of being so jacked up for the yeah. wedding. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, a lot of people coming over to Italy, but uh, at this point, um, you know, it looks like we're probably just going to push it a year uh, and then, you know, and then get it out in Italy. But, um, you know, that was sort of the primary focus. And now, dude, it's just about, you know, staying safe, staying healthy, uh, making the most of this time. My fiance and I both travel for work. So we've kind of tried to see this as a blessing that we're, you know, together for this extended period of time, not having to go anywhere. Um, and just trying to find silver linings in each day, uh, during, during this period of craziness. Good for you. And you know, what I love about this is obviously you've endured just pure conundrum and mayhem during this time, especially when you have a wedding in freaking Italy. How many how many hours, days, months, years you've been spending planning this, but yet you still have, there's two paths to take, right? It could be, woe is me, my wedding went to shit, I have to replan it, put out a year, or it's put in perspective, hey, you know what, now I have more time with my fiance, gives us the time to settle back and look at things differently. So I just love that approach. But you know, when I was doing some research on you, Ryan, what seems like a lifetime ago was just March 11th. And what was pretty cool or just interesting, right, is that you were a big part of your calling game. And tell me where I'm wrong, but you're doing game by game on March 11th. And this is the eve before kind of like the coronavirus news really was spread. And I believe it was Mark Cuban in the Dallas Mavericks Denver Nuggets game that he had his first reaction to hearing the NBA suspended. So Tell, tell me about like that night and like what was happening, especially given your prior research, knowing you have a wedding in Italy and seeing what's happening there. It was wild, man. So, yeah, I was I was doing that game, Mavericks Nuggets, on March 11th with Doris Burke and Tom Rinaldi. And um, we have a production meeting uh, every, like, let's say sometime around lunch, the day of the okay. game. And normally we're going to talk about like, oh, you know, in the game open, like right when we come on the air. This is how we're going to set the table for the game. These are the subjects we're going to get into. And at that point, we had kind of been emailing about, oh, are we going to go basketball or do we need to kind of address some of the developments with COVID-19 as it pertains to sports? At that time, there weren't yet the incredibly drastic developments, but there were starting to be trickles of change. And that day, the NBA had had a call with its board of governors discussing how they were going to 
you know, react to this. The Warriors had decided they weren't going to be able to play in front of fans. Uh, some NCAA uh, conference tournaments had started to go that route with no fans. And Doris and I sat there at lunch, and we just had this eerie feeling, and we were like, you know, we know this night is probably going to be our last time calling a game in front of a crowd uh, and on site for a while. And so we had that feeling anyway. And then I want to say it was late first quarter, early second quarter. We're on the air, and Doris is checking Twitter, and she sees that the Jazz and the Thunder are being pulled off the court before the start of their game because of suspicions that Rudy Gobert may have tested positive. Well, so now all of a sudden we're shifting, right? And now we're like, okay, whoa, this landscape may totally change. And what ends up happening is Rudy Gobert tests positive, right? And we get that news. And now all of a sudden our game broadcast becomes more of a newscast. We're going back to the studio. We're checking in with Scott Van Pelt and our NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski. And we, then we get the news that the season has been suspended. But the game, our game it's is still going up. Right, it, which is just a very odd juxtaposition, you know. And yeah. so it was kind of trying to find the right tenor and tone, uh, you know, to be, you know, respectful of the news and appropriate, sure. but also addressing the action in front of you. And so it was a totally different broadcast than we've ever done. Honestly, Doris and I, by the end of it, we were both, we were emotional uh, at the end because sure. it, was, it was just a very disorienting, you know, obviously, you know, sort of a, a weird taxing experience. And I think also just the understanding that we're all about to go through something, you know, humanity is about to go through something we haven't um, in a very, very long time. So it was, um, it was wild navigating that night for sure, man. Yeah, the balance of prioritizing what's happening outside of your world and your bubble in the court, and then actually trying to manage that happening on a game to game basis. I can't even imagine. Now, one thing I'm thinking about when I watch the clip is the player. So you got Mark Cuban, who's like, his reaction was priceless. We're going to play it here. And on top of that, you have the players still going full speed. So in the actual stadium, like, was there, did, did the players know? Did the fans know? Like, what was that like? You know, so it's interesting uh, to say that because um, Mark Cuban, there was that great shot, exactly, yeah. him reacting to the news when he sees it on his phone. Our director, yeah. Jeff Evers, got that shot, and we were just all like, that's the shot of the night, you know, um, and, and will be the shot of, like, sports reacting to coronavirus. And uh, Mark came over to the broadcast table um, at the end of the quarter after the news and um, he was talking to Doris and me, and uh, – we had been trying to get a hold of Mavericks PR to ask if Mark would do an interview with Tom Rinaldi, our sideline reporter for that night. But the NBA had just implemented these policies of you have to be six feet apart. So they weren't doing interviews like that anymore. However, sure. Mark, to his credit, knowing you know he is one of the preeminent voices of the league and of the sports world in general, felt like it was absolutely appropriate to do the interview there. Tom still gave respectful distance, but he told Doris and I, yeah, I'll do it. So we were able to coordinate. And one of the questions Tom asked him was, Mark, are your players aware of what has gone on, that the season is suspended as they're playing this game? And Mark said, yes, they all know. So the players all knew. I think via technology, the crowd probably was aware. However, the crowd was not reacting in a way that made you feel like, they were necessarily aware where I think we saw it um, manifest most in the players was at the very end of the game. It okay. seemed like they kind of turned up the intensity, dialed it up knowing ah, this may be the last time we're on the floor in a while, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that was really, I think after the news broke, that was the period of time where Doris and I were able to most focus on the action because yep. all of a sudden, you know, we had spent a lot of time kind of, you know, painting the picture with the news. And now the players themselves seem to be, you know, engaged on a higher frequency to finish the game. Yeah. And a complete side note from all that. I know we talked a little bit about Mark Cuban, but I think the way that he has managed this as a, as a sports owner and a leader in this country is just incredible. He consistently puts people first. um, And I love the way that he's continuing to pay his employees It's amazing. So when we transition quickly back to the conversation, it's my understanding Doris Burke actually tested positive for COVID. And she's not only, you know, a co-anchor and an analyst of yours, but a friend. How how is she doing with everything? She's doing great. Thank God. She, uh, she, um, 
you know, it was interesting because uh, I, I had been, I also broadcast Brooklyn Nets games for the Yes Network, right? And I had been with them on their West Coast trip the night before I joined our ESPN crew in uh, mm-hmm. Dallas. And um, we got the news uh, then Saturday or, or Friday, I think it was Saturday, that the Nets had tested, um, I think it was Thursday, Friday, whatever day it was, we got the yeah. news that four Nets had tested positive uh, for COVID-19. And so all of us who had been a part of the traveling party at any point on that road trip were told, hey, you need to quarantine for two weeks. So I reach out to our ESPN crew. Yeah. Hey, just want to give you guys a heads up because I was just with you. I feel fine. I have no symptoms. However, I was around people who had it. So monitor yourselves, et cetera. Well, Doris responds and says, hey, guys, um, I'm actually just going to let you know I've been in bed the last couple of days. I don't have a high fever. I don't have a cough. And remember, at that time, those were really thought to be the symptoms of COVID-19 before real, people realized they could be broader. Sure. Uh, she was like, but, you know, I don't feel well. I'm going to monitor this and let you guys know. Well, when we thought back to it, Doris actually had had a bad headache uh, starting Wednesday, the day we did the game together. Wow. And so we ended up being in touch throughout the, the you know, process, starting with that Friday, whatever day it was that the Nets uh, um, announced they tested positive. And Doris and I were in touch the entire time. And, you know, within a couple of days, she felt, I mean, she like felt like she couldn't get out of bed, as she's talked about. Um, and, uh, and she ended up going and getting tested. And so we were in contact throughout that entire time. She didn't end up getting her test results for eight days, but at some point during that, she pretty much knew she was like, I know I have this, I can just, you know, and, uh, and so then, you know, that was obviously direct contact for me. So I was already quarantining, but now I was like, okay, yeah, absolutely. I obviously need to be, um, self quarantining and, and, uh, and she kind of updated us on our progress throughout. Thank God, you know, she, um, she avoided any of the, uh, you know, pneumonia symptoms. And, sure. And, uh, and she's, uh, I'd say she probably had symptoms something like 10 days. It was mostly like extreme, extreme fatigue, a little yeah. bit of a fever, and then got to the other side and has been feeling great, thankfully. So, and now to her credit, you know, she's really been um, trying to be an advocate uh, working with different you know, medical facilities, trying to figure out if she can help in any way, as well as tell her story. That's amazing. So glad to hear she's doing well and that you know she's putting like forth her effort to put us all in a better position. It's amazing. Uh, amen is right. So before we get into kind of your career path, I'm just curious, what do you think all like, obviously, this is a huge impact on sports, right? I mean, we're seeing the Olympics get delayed. And then I think it, we all knew that sports were the forefront of entertainment. But now more than ever, we know it. What do you if you had a magic crystal ball, what do you think it looks like? And when do you think, you know, things will be back up and running, just taking a, you know, a swing at it? What do you think it'll look like? You know, it's so interesting because it's obviously um, it's a moving target. Right. And and you talk to so often in this business, when you talk to certain people, you know, certain executives, insiders, they know things and they may not want them out there. But they do know things, you know, in this case, I really believe nobody knows anything because, you know, we have lacked uniformity across our country with how we've responded to Mm -hmm. this virus. Right. So you could say like, oh you know, we're on the other side of the curve, it's leveled off in this state or this state or this state, but it might still be at the apex in this state, you know, and it's like, well, you know, how do you put people together? So there really is no conclusive um, answer at this time. However, what I think could be possible um, is I think you could see a situation where you have, uh, you might have a situation where you're playing with no fans in July or August, let's say the NBA, maybe they jump right to the playoffs and it's just a postseason yeah. tournament based on what had happened with seedings uh, through the regular season since they did play a substantial portion of the regular season. Baseball will try and get in as many regular season games as they can. Might mean sure. multiple doubleheaders a week. They'll expand their rosters um, and then they'll maybe have an expanded postseason as well to try and satisfy sort of that championship feel. The NFL at this point, I think because they're situated for the fall, is acting as if they can proceed as planned. Hopefully they will be able to by then. That's obviously a long ways out, but you know, they'll have to perhaps be malleable. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised, Jason. The one thing I think is like, you know, a possibility, which you've heard some whispers about, I don't know yeah. how feasible it is, but taking, you know, a league to one site, a neutral site, 
testing everybody, everybody yeah. who's going to be around, you know, in any way yeah. and having, you know, I don't know where you can feasibly do that. Cause like yeah. a city would seem to be still too sprawling to contain. Right. Sure. But I don't know if there's a way to have some sort of like quarantine zone in a city that has facilities uh, to play where you say like, look, you know, everybody who is allowed within this zone yeah. has to be tested, cleared, and then they can play. And we're just going to bring everything here and including the broadcast teams, you know, the, you know, any of the technicians, any, anybody maintenance, the athletes, the coaches, staff, anybody would have to be tested, cleared, and then kept there for the duration of the season. It seems extreme. I don't know if you can really pull it off, yeah. but I think that, the only thing that I can say definitively is everybody is open-minded to everything at this moment. Yeah, exactly. And I think creativity is going to have to be the answer because there isn't an exact answer. And I think what you, you mentioned earlier, like look at someone like Doris Burke, who it takes eight days for her to get a result. My girlfriend had symptoms for five days and after five days she had to get tested. It took six days, right? So it's just, it's the, the testing process is a little slow. Um, the total cases and total deaths is being reported in, in different manners across the entire world. And to your point, it just leads to the one consistency, which is change. And planning when consistency has changed in these type of circumstances are just so difficult. You know, to wrap up, I guess, this part of the conversation, I wonder if, and I'm curious your opinion, do you think that any of the, um, the pro leagues will take any type of change given the circumstance? Do you think they'll allow this cha change to actually create a lifetime change? And the one I'm specifically thinking about is baseball. And you, you clearly would know much better than, than I do, but I know they're having a difficulty time connecting with a younger audience, the length of the games, things like that. And if they have to do these double headers, do you think there's a chance they would shorten like the total amount of innings and potentially make a lifelong change within the league given these circumstances? I think that that is absolutely a possibility for every single sport. And here's why. You know, we all hold to our traditions and our idea of what is fair and what is normal until yeah. Mother Nature or the universe or God or whoever you want to, you know, attribute to it says, you know, you know that routine that you had, you know those, you know, that paradigm you thought couldn't be shaken you know, he, here's a total, you know, rock to it. And in this case, I, if you're baseball and, you know, you've been the sport probably most resistant to change, yeah. although I do believe this current commissioner is very open-minded about change, which is helpful. Um, but as a sport, it's certainly had the reputation, and I think rightly so, about being resistant to change. Well, now you have no choice, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, the door is now open in your mind because it was forced open. And yeah. once you open it, you may then actually find evidence to say, hold on, our sport is better like this. And sure. we don't need to hold to past ideals because as we've seen, those can get knocked down thanks to a virus or, you know, some other supernatural force. Right. So uh, if baseball comes back and all of a sudden finds that there's seven inning, let's say they're playing seven inning doubleheaders and they find that the seven inning games are more scintillating. Uh, quicker, obviously, more suited to the younger audience. Maybe they say, you know what? Yeah, it was nine innings forever, and that was pre-corona, and this yeah. is the post-corona age, you know. And 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 we've all had to adapt. Or in the case of the NBA, you know, uh, Mark Cuban's been open-minded for a while, and I think maybe even pushing uh, for the NBA season to start Christmas and go till August. Well, if the NBA season resumes this year in July and goes till August they're not going to be able to come back with training camp in late September and play in sure. October. They're going to have to push it out. So maybe this ends up becoming, you know, the trigger to push their season back to where they're having a season that starts Christmas ends in August. You know, I think that any of those possibilities are going to be on the table because I just think everybody is going to realize that their normal is not, is not there um, without the possibility of being disrupted. And so if there's a possibility of it being disrupted anyway, why not be open-minded to making changes that you think would enhance your sport? 
So well said. I love hearing that perspective and you just getting your take, given your experiences is interesting. I think there's already so many takeaways, but I want to take a few steps back. We just heard about your last month, right? Which has been a wild month, A to Z, personally in the business, what's next? I want to take a, a, a couple, one, two, three years step back to when you were at Fordham University, Ryan, and kind of as a student, right? So a lot of people that are watching this are current students. And sometimes your major and your view aligns with where you actually end up and what you're doing. And other times they're complete detours. So I'm curious in your perspective at Fordham, you know, as a student, what were you like? What were you studying? And did you imagine the career you're having today? Was that part of the map since day one? Yeah. In in fact, if you even look at my fifth grade yearbook for career goal, it'll say uh, be uh, an announcer for the Yankees. So so cool. It's really cool. That's really cool. And so I knew what I wanted to do. And um, you know, uh my fiance will will often say to me, like, you know, you're so lucky that like your your passion, you know, is is your career. Like, you know, you're so lucky. And I always say, You're right, but I feel like I'm even more lucky that I even knew what my passion was, you know. Yeah, because you know, think about it. I'm sure, you know, you're talking about you know, the ages of people who are watching right now, you know, they, uh, I mean, what percentage of kids who are in college have no idea what, you know, they're passionate about. And by the way, as, as we all hear touted all the time, and it's true, that's sure. totally normal. And that's totally fine. You know, yeah. um, if you are a person who does happen to know, you know, what they are passionate about, uh, uh, those, those ages where nothing is yet really expected of you, I feel like are so critical to pour yourself fully into and get the most out of my whole mentality when I was at Fordham was I am literally going to spend every second I can investing in becoming a better broadcaster Um, so that when I come out of here and then the world does expect something of me, I am ahead of the game. And I was given incredible resources to be in that position. Uh, going to Fordham itself was a blessing because our radio station, WFUV, has a ridiculous base of alumni who are always willing to help. Incredible equipment. I had a mentor, Bob Ahrens, who taught me play-by-play and had worked with some of the finest broadcasters in the country. And so I had no excuses, for sure. And then my mentality was just like, this is my focus. Like, this is what I know I want to do. So yeah, when I was sitting in science class, which was part of the core curriculum, you know what I was doing? I was looking at my game boards for my broadcasts, you know? I love it. I just, I, you know, this is what I want to do. I don't want to be a scientist. You know? That's amazing. I think there's so many takeaways from just that com- those comments, right? So a couple of them. One, I think when you write something down, it's so great to go back to it to see what you were thinking at that time. And it also becomes easier, in my opinion, to manifest it, right? So how cool is that? And fifth gr- from fifth grade, you could see what was going on in your brain. And I don't think it's ever too late to do that. And I think one thing I'm advocating is now more than ever, it's time to journal and get your thoughts down. And when you look at some of the biggest and best companies that were created, a lot of them were created in a time of recession when we have this time to kind of realign everything. The second thing I think that's really cool about your story is that you had a passion and under no circumstances were you going to let any noise kind of come into what your passion was and what your path was. And that I could tell you is not the the case for everybody. And certainly, you know, wasn't the case for me. What's interesting is I was, and it took me too long, but I think it took me short enough period of time that I was able to readjust and detour. But I was always just chasing money and title, chasing money and title. And I knew what I had to do to get it. I had to go to a top MBA program. I had to go at night. I had to, you know, do X amount of work at the bank and I had to relocate and I moved from New York to Seattle. And finally, after 10 years of grinding, paying off my student debt, I got the six figure uh, signing bonus, the title I wanted. And I was in Seattle, Washington. Life was everything I could imagine. The problem was, life was as empty as it had ever been at that point in my life, right? And that's because I was chasing things that didn't align with really where my heart was. And that's so cool that at a young age, you were able to do it. So knowing that you did that and what, and knowing that you had this path, what was your first couple jobs out of school? And then within those jobs, how did you navigate to make sure that you were always, you know, the forefront of where you wanted to be and moving to the next position? Yeah. So when I was um, when I was a senior at Fordham, we had a play-by-play contest, 
And uh, it's called, that was named after Marty Glickman, Marty Glickman Award, Marty Glickman, great all-time play-by-play guy who really shaped um, the teaching that we learned in play-by-play at WFUV um, okay. at our radio station. And uh, one, uh, one of the judges was a guy named Pete Silverman, who was an executive producer of ESPN Radio in New York. And he heard me and really liked me. I, at the same time, had simultaneously had an internship at the Yes Network, which turned into doing stats for Yankee Telecast. And just to give some perspective of how it turned into that, I, someone, you know, helped get me in the door of, yep. with the internship. And then my whole mentality was like, I am just going to outwork everybody. I'm going uh-huh. to be a great teammate. And I literally, I mean, I would transcribe tape for hours, which anybody who's ever done that knows, like, it's, I mean, it's not a fun task. It's not glory. You know, it's not obviously what I eventually envisioned for my career, but I knew if I crush this task, they're yeah. going to give me another one. And then if yeah. I crush that one, they're going to give me another one. You know, and if they, if I'm someone who, you know, people want to be around, they're going to look for opportunities for me. And that's, that happened with my internship and developed into doing stats for the Yankees. So I'm doing stats. I'm the statistician in the booth. They're getting to know me. I'm doing on air stuff at Fordham. And then um, I had people at the Yes Network who got to know me through the stats. And then I had these executives who listened to me because of my work at Fordham and kind of like, oh, okay, you know what? We think Ryan can do this. So I get an opportunity at ESPN Radio um, right out of school. And I remember having a conversation with my agent and I said, um, you know, I want to do play-by-play. Like this is an offer to do updates, like sports updates, you know, where I give like a minute, a 60 second sports cast of what's going on in the day, you know? Um, and uh, like, that's not what I want to do. I want to do play-by-play. And she was like, trust me, do this now. You're going to be on the air in New York at 21 years old. Do this now. You'll crush it and more opportunities will come. And that is the way, you know, my career kind of developed. I had this image in my mind and I said, if you crack the door open for me, I will kick it down. That was the image that I kept with me throughout the entire time. Because I understand I am not naive to to privilege, to opportunity, to, you know, um, to people, you know, being given, you know, that first step, because you need someone to take that chance on you. You need someone to crack that door open for you, you know, and there are different methods to get it. But once you get that door open, then it's up to you to kick it down. And that's kind of what I tried to do. And so, you know, doing updates at ESPN radio became randomly hosting shows. Then it became, um, hosting my own show at 5 a.m. Then it became hosting a show at 10 a.m. Then it became co-hosting with Stephen A. Smith. Now, all the while, I want to be doing play-by-play, you know, and I'm sure. saying, well, I don't want to be a talk show host, but I knew it's still enough in the same sphere that if I keep growing here and doing good work, people will notice the play-by-play aspect as well. And the Yes Network was simultaneously then giving me opportunities like, oh, we like Ryan on stats. Hey, we hear him on ESPN radio. We heard him at Fordham. Let's give them an opportunity to do a college game we have on Yes. Okay. You know what? We like that. The Nets are not good this year. We can hide them on a Nets broadcast. Let's have them do a Nets broadcast. Okay. We like them on that. Let's give them some more Nets. Yeah. And then a suddenly, you know, each thing grows. And then all of a sudden you're doing play-by-play for ESPN and play-by-play for the Yankees just by building them all up. You know? I love, I love that quote. If you crack that door open, I will break it and knock it down. That is an awesome quote. I think that's a, it's just such a cool story that, you know, things were a means to an end for you. And you obviously had to put elbow grease in and do things that you weren't technically asked to do, but you saw that every experience gave you some type of value add to bring you to the next step. There was a CEO of a major corporation I interviewed and I asked him if he had one bit of advice as it comes to career navigation, what would he give? And it was very similar to that. What he said is like, I imagine my career like I'm in this rocket ship. And when I'm in this rocket ship, I'm going to land somewhere, wherever that may be. And it might not be exactly where I want to go. But wherever I land, I'm going to take all the experiences from that. I'm not going to stay there too long until I get all those experiences. Then I'm going to let my rocket ship go. And he's like, it's never going to be this linear thing you imagine, but you'll be amazed at the places you go if you could take the most out of them and then be able to transition when the time is there. And it sounds like that's exactly what you've done. You know what, man? And, and the, I think the key is like when you are in, you know, you know, intermediate step seven of your 600 step career plan or whatever it might be nothing's more important than that step right if you're looking ahead if you are you know losing yourself in well this is you know 
where I, where I want to be and I'm focused on that. And ah, I really would rather be doing this. Well, guess what? You're never getting there because you're going to screw up the step you're on. You have to have that vision and those goals, but then your whole attention has to be on crushing whatever is on your plate that day. Because if I don't transcribe the tape well, then guess what? They don't ask me to do stats for the Yankees telecast. And if I don't do the stats well, then they don't care to get to know me and be around me and say, hey, I'll listen to your play-by-play, you know? Mm-hmm. And if I don't do the Fordham games well, well, I don't get a chance to do Yes Network broadcasts, you know? So, and everything relates like that. But the only way you can actually do it well is to, you know, focus on that task. I, I, whenever I have, um, I don't have personal interns, but whenever I'm around interns at Yes, or when I hosted uh, my radio shows at ESPN or just at ESPN Now, and if I see... Somebody comes in and on day one or two, they're like, how do I get a full-time job here? I, I, I want to throw them out right away. Because yeah. why, why would I want to give you a full-time job? I know nothing about whether or not you're worthy of that. Instead, what I want to see is you saying yes to everything and doing it with passion and energy and positivity, being a good teammate to be around. you know. And, and if you do that, inevitably, people will give you opportunities. You know, my, um, my one, uh, I'm represented by CAA. My two agents are Matt Kramer and Nick Khan. And Nick okay. has a great, he has a great quote. He says, and he always says, the jobs will open. And he's right. Like, even when you think like, no, this will never come. It will. So focus yeah. on what you're doing right then. Crush the work right then. Because eventually the opportunity will be there if you keep taking care of today. I love that. And the thing that the big takeaway for me there is there are no shortcuts in execution, right? You have to execute, but there are strategic alignments that'll help you get to the next step. So I think that's, you know, one of my takeaways uh, from you is that you, you don't ever shortcut in execution, but align yourself with the right people. So a question I have, if there is someone that is trying to maybe break into TV or radio, there's some things that you said early on. You said, you know, I had spoken to my agent and I had gotten a job with ESPN. So if we take a few steps back, those partnerships, how do you, you know, like for an average person, if this is something I want to do, how do you find an agent? How do you even get in the door at ESPN? You know, what is a starting point for that? You know, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's hard because it, I always say this to young kids who are trying to get into broadcasting. I say, in some ways, you're, you're doing this at the best time ever because yeah. there's more platforms than ever before, right? Um, you know, what we're doing right now is a testament to that, right? Like, you can leverage your following and your career success into now a show, you know? Like, mm-hmm. there's an actual platform to do this, right? Um, and, you know, whether it's... Um, we could take a huge one satellite radio, you know, I mean, yeah. 20 years ago, that wasn't an option. Now sure. it is, you know, um, obviously social media and, and the different platforms there, there's a lot of different places. So in some cases, it's the best time ever to be getting into this business. In some cases, it's the worst because there's more competition than ever before. Right. And I always think the key is, you know, one getting reps, you know, and reps meaning just like on air reps on air being, front of a camera, doesn't actually have to be going anywhere, you know, into a microphone, could be a recording to yourself, could be a recording to your dog, your mom, your dad, whoever, but just getting comfortable and honestly evaluating what do I like, what do I not like, maybe having someone you trust take a listen. You don't need a broad audience then because you're getting better. I actually, when I was a junior in college, I had people who wanted to hear my demo tape who were potential employers. And I said, no, I'm going to send it to you next year because I knew I wasn't going to be graduating until a year and a half later, a year later, sure. right? Sure. And I, and I was like, there, I want you to hear me when I've had another year of development because the growth as a broadcaster from junior year of college to senior year of college is enormous because those are new reps, you know? I mean, the growth from 32 to 33 is hopefully big, but it's much less noticeable than 20 to 21, you know? And I I feel like that is part of the mentality of like, you know, it doesn't matter really at that time who's hearing you. It just matters that you are getting reps and you are getting better. And the only person you should be concerned about hearing it is someone who can give you feedback to get you better. Not someone who's a prospective employer. 
because you have time to develop yeah. in those ages, yeah. you know? And I feel like getting the reps however you can is key. And then the other thing is think about anybody who has even the slightest tangential connection to the industry and how you can connect with them. You know, you may not have, um, you know, a family friend who is an agent or who's a writer or who's a radio host, but maybe you know somebody who knows somebody who works at the local TV station. Yeah. And you say, hey, um, you know, Jason, could you contact Evan and have Evan talk to Sydney about uh, maybe me going in and shadowing, you know, mm -hmm. someone there. And, you know, that hand, this is not something you can learn in a book. So you need that sure. hands-on experience. And wherever yeah. it comes, whatever local station it comes in, it's going to be valuable. So just think about like what weird connection to get me in the door anywhere that has some form of media, because you're going to then get valuable learning experience. And even if that's behind the scenes, yeah. make sure you're getting, if you want to be on air, make sure you're still getting on air reps in some way, even if it's just into a microphone to yourself. For sure. So I agree with that completely. One of the big takeaways from me on that is you said, in, in other words, is like sometimes slow down to speed up, take a step back to move four steps forward. And in a world today where speed is just go, 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 check your boxes, we're not doing enough of that. And I think the example of not sending your demo tape in immediately when you want to is a perfect per and being self aware to do that is really that's I mean, that's remarkable. Um, you know, so there are some really cool takeaways there. Another one, Ryan, when I I was asking around about Ryan Rucco and I, I called a couple of people, did some research. One thing you still haven't hit on yet was people had said that the best thing about Ryan is his preparation. He prepares like no other. So can you, can you speak to that? Do you agree with that? Is that something that you would attest to? Yeah. You know what? It makes, it makes me happy that that's said, because that to me is probably the, um, you know, what I would want the hallmark of my broadcast to be. You know, uh, you, you cannot, you cannot perform if you are not prepared. You just can't, you know, I mean, yeah. and one of the ways I, one of the things I equate it to is like, think about theater. Okay. Imagine an actor going on stage, you know, and not having prepared, you know, rehearse their line, you know, yeah. like, oh baby, baby, and it's the wrong words on the cue cards. I don't know the song. Like you couldn't, they can't just perform, you know, once they're prepared and they've rehearsed, there are elements that just can come out naturally, but in order for them to perform that way, they have to be prepared, you know? And, you know, that's not to say I'm rehearsing what I'm going to say on air before I, I, I get on air. Cause that it's not that, but what it is, is it's okay. I've studied every player. I know the storylines of the team, right? So when I go into a national NBA game, for example, I've watched the most recent games of the Nuggets and the Mavericks. I have read their local newspapers over the last three or four or five days because I don't want to sound like the national broadcaster parachuting in who doesn't have his finger on the pulse of what's happening locally. You know, I've, I've studied, we get great emails from our research department of great nuggets and notes. I make manila folders. I think I actually have one here in front of me. So I make these manila folders. This will be like different nuggets that'll have like, I'll have the entire team, okay? Wow. And, and then on the inside, I'll have like storylines um, and, uh, and other so, special nuggets, notes, and then conversations that we've had um, with, you know, players, coaches, whatever. And you're, you're, you're putting all that down somewhere. Now, Mike Breen, who's the voice of the NBA, taught me this when I was in college. Wait up, uh, up. Uh, he's a Fordham grad as well. And the first workshop he ever did for us um, that I, when I was in school, I was 19. And I'll never forget. He said, you know, you only use about 10 to 15 percent of what you prepare for this. But you never know what 10 to 15 percent. So you have to have it all. And, and it's true. So when I go into a broadcast, you know, I don't know if, you know, maybe I think, you know, the eighth guy off the bench isn't going to play much, right? And so I'm going to prepare more for Giannis Adetokounmpo than I am for Dante DiVincenzo, right? However, sure. I still have to have some stuff on Dante because what if that night he scores 30 points or he breaks his leg and I need to talk about it? You know what I mean? So right. it's just like you don't know 
you have to be prepared for it all. And then that's what gives you, you know, the ability to perform no different dude than you do in this interview, right? Like I appreciate that you've done research, right? So you're asking interesting informed questions that allow me to actually speak more to my experience, right? Whereas if you just got on mic and you're like, Hey, dude, tell me about yourself. You know, right. right. All right. Well, this interview is going to suck. You know, like, right. so, exactly. you got you got to prepare. You have to. You, and you can't do something, you know, from performing as well in front of a microphone. You cannot do something live if you are not prepared. You just you, you have to have some semblance of preparation. Absolutely. I think there's you can rely on your gut, your instincts, your intuition to a certain extent, and then it's only a certain extent. And I think breaking it down layman's term was the easiest way. Imagine a Broadway production. Imagine you spend all this money on a ticket and the the, the actress or Broadway performer doesn't know their lines and can't say like you have to prepare. There is no substitute for it. So I think there are just so many, so many takeaways from that. But okay, so I, yeah. I'll, I'll hop on one more thing on that note. Yeah. yeah. I go back to my high school, uh, Hackley in Tarrytown, and I, I go speak on um, the first Fridays of uh, the, the uh, semester. They do um, like a public speaking to the junior class. One of the things that I always say is like the worst thing you can ever hear. Just think about being at a wedding is someone say, oh, you know what? I, I'm just going to go off the cuff. I'm just going to speak from the heart. Like, 99% of the time, those speeches are train wreck. Awful. Because <laughs> Because it's just like, you know, just like you wouldn't be like for your driver's test, like, you know, ah, you know what, I'm just going to wing it. I'm not going to prepare. I'm not going to try parallel parking at all. Like, nah, I'm just going to wing it. Like, it's just about sort of finding, like, how do you speak in your normal, natural way, but with preparation, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's specifically for public speaking, but it applies to anything. You are always going to be, you know, um, you're always going to handle it better when there's some level of preparation. And then it's just sort of finding that lane of being natural after the preparation. And, and there is a way to do that and accomplish both. All right. So now you talked about natural preparation. I got to ask this. So obviously there's natural skill sets and I need to know this voice of yours is unbelievable for radio. Did you work on this voice or is this actually your voice? Is this your real Ryan Rucco voice? Thank you, man. I appreciate that. No, this is it, man. This is it. I, I can't love sing. it. Thank you, man. I can't, I can't sing at all. Um, I think, you, you know, one of the things like my mentor was really big on was like, um, he, he would really hone in on us speaking in our normal voice, but just with more energy, right? Okay. Because if I get on air and I do Mr. Joe announcer voice and I'm like, well, Jason, welcome today to Yankee <laughs> Stadium. You know, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't stand this guy, you know? Um, but, if I, but if I talk just like, if I'm, you know, if I'm talking just in my apartment to my fiance and I'm just saying like, hey, babe, do you really want to watch the next episode of Tiger King? Like, you know, that also doesn't have enough energy, you know? So it's like, it, it's sort of just finding your normal voice, but yeah. with energy. And that, yeah. that, that's kind of, I always feel like the best way to have your broadcast voice. And I think that can apply to so that can apply if you're on a date, an interview, if you're giving a presentation, right? That's a takeaway you can take in almost every forum of life. Which you're is right, awesome. man. You're so right. Yeah. Think about it. Like if you're, if you're on a date and the person just like flatlining the whole yeah. time, like you're not you're just not going to be engaged, you know, it's not going just, anywhere. No, it's, it's, it's definitely not. And, and, and same thing with a job interview or like, you know, just even think about when you, anybody who you listen to, like what makes you pay attention, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and certainly you just, you have to have, there has to be some sound of energy. And I think like enjoyment in the voice. For sure. All right. So, so Ryan, we talked a lot about where you've been and how you've got to where you are today. As we're kind of concluding this, you know, what now you're in a new chapter in your life. What does the rest of it look like? Like, what in your perfect world, what does the rest of your career look like? And what are some things you want to achieve? You know, it's, um, it's interesting, right? Because, um, I think the, the way, uh, we all now I try and have perspective in general about life and and I truly believe, hey, if I have my health, um, you know, and I have my family, I can deal with the rest and I'll figure yeah. it out, you know. But I, I do believe even for those of us who do try and live by that code, you know, when you are ambitious and you are driven and, and you're working hard, it's so easy to get lost in in that ambition and, and sort of focusing on um, oh, what's, you know, 
all right, I want to achieve this. I got to achieve this. I know I'm yeah. ready. Like, ah, you know? And so, um, like, I know I want to call championships on a network level. You know, I know that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I want to call big events uh, with great teammates. And that's, that's my vision now. You know, that could mean someday being, you know, the number one voice of the Yankees that could mean calling the NBA finals someday that could mean calling huge heavyweight fights that could mean calling the world series you know that could mean a variety of different things however like I think you know my perspective on it in general is like my more uh, you know immediate focus is going to be like hey how do I just keep getting better and you know and keep feeling like I'm doing great work with what I'm doing now, because inevitably those other opportunities will come when they should come. And if they don't come, it's because something else presented itself that I couldn't have even imagined. That's even better for my life, you know? And I think we've all seen that manifest in our dating lives in different ways at different times, right? Like, Oh my gosh, you want this person so bad. Ah, you know, like, and, and then you realize, wow, the best thing that ever happened to me was that not happening because thank God I have this, you know, I know when I think about like my fiance, Andrea is the biggest blessing in my life. And when I think about my journey to her, I had, you know, I, I had to go through so much of that other, like thinking I wanted something and then kind of evolving as a person and to be ready for true love, you know? And I think about that in my career as well. Like, I know I want these opportunities and I believe yeah. they will come someday. But I also try and be open-minded to if I keep doing the right things day in, day out of my career, maybe the pinnacle actually manifests in a totally different way that I didn't see coming. Yeah. And if that's the case, that's the case. You know, do, do I want to do those things? I really do. Mm -hmm. But I, I am not going to close myself off to the possibility of there being other ways to sort of like feel like I've, um, you know, I've achieved that ultimate dream or ultimate goal. Yeah, I think that's so well said. One thing that I'm a big advocate of is embracing change because change is inevitable. It's going to happen no matter what. And whether it's in your personal relationships or career, I love the attitude of I am going to go to bed in a better position than I woke up. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to fail. It doesn't mean I'm going to fall on my face. But something today is going to happen that I am going to move the chains forward and I'm going to learn from what happened so that in tomorrow I'm in a better place. And if it's learning from past relationships or fights that bring you to your wife or bring you to your next step in your career or whatever it may be, if you're not learning from yesterday, then you're just doing yourself a disservice. And it sounds like you know, you're doing all that. It's become sort of a, a cliche phrase, right? But I think what you're talking about, what I'm talking about, and what actually is so important is that growth mindset, right? Um, yeah. And I know it becomes a trigger uh, for it almost just sounds like a oh, new age hipster phrase, growth mindset. <laughs> but I think what it really speaks to, you know, more so is being comfortable with um, failing and understanding it's an opportunity to grow, right? It's not. It, it does not mean that you don't get mad when you fail. You know, it does not mean that it does not emotionally affect you. It should. But it just means that you end up looking at it as a stepping stone rather than as, you know, a total roadblock. Um, and, uh, and I think that's so key. You know, I think about one example in my career um, was uh, WNBA Finals, which I broadcast on ESPN 2015. Um, I think it was 2015 or was it 2016? I think it was 2016. Okay. LA Sparks are playing the Minnesota Lynx. And um, game five of a five-game series. It was an unbelievable series, unbelievable game, one of the best games in WNBA history. And um, at the end of the game, the refs missed a key call. And they themselves screwed up when they were supposed to go to the replay monitor uh, for a shot clock violation. Okay. And I said, hey, they're going to review this on the other side of the break. And um, they had given the signal like they were going to review it. I knew I, I had a like in my gut, I thought, I don't think they can review it anymore because they waited. And under two minutes, you have to go to the table right away. They didn't. I don't think they can actually review it. But I didn't say that. I just went with, all right, they're going to review this on the other side. And they couldn't. Yeah. Review. And my gut was correct. And it stunk to be wrong 
in that big moment and to, to, to get that wrong. And I remember thinking like, oh, because we had a great broadcast. It was an amazing, amazing game. But I couldn't like fully enjoy it because I knew like I, I messed that up. I messed that up. And what it ended up doing was sharpening my tool set on the rule and, and making sure to trust my gut with them. So now when, I, when something comes up with, with any kind of rule, I immediately go to you know, my sources in the league office, refs, whatever, and I ask them, hey, this came up in a game. Can you explain it to me? Because I want whenever something comes up with rules, which is a way bigger thing for play-by-play -play guys than you think, but it turns out to be a crucial part of our job. Whenever something comes up, I want to be the foremost authority in the building that night outside of the refs. And that, that has become a focus because of that failure. And now I know how many times it has served me. And now I'm grateful that I failed in that moment because of the way it's helped me so many subsequent times since. Such a perfect example of, of taking accountability, being self-aware, and using kind of a screw-up to put yourself in a better position to be that much better for the entirety of your career. I love it. I said Ryan, it's been this has been so much fun talking about you know relevant things that you just experienced in the last month to back when you were at Fordham to your map from fifth grade on to today and what's next. This has been honestly such a pleasure. One thing we do at on a restart interview is we do a little restart rapid fire to wrap things up so we can learn a little bit more about you, some of your favorite people and stuff like that. So if you're all right with it, we're going to fire off five to 10 questions to learn just a little bit more about Ryan Rucco. I love it, man. Love it. Let's do it. Okay. So the first one is what company would you, or do you currently invest in right now? Uh, sound T. Uh, sound T. Tell me more about it. Yeah, Sound Tea. Um, it is an uh, incredible company, organic, uh, zero calorie, uh, sparkling beverage company um, that uh, really was sort of at um, the advent of um, uh, sparkling tea. Um, combines um, sort of the intersection of the need for bubbles without yep. sugar um, and then uh, the functionality of tea um, and also the way people have gotten into the sparkling water industry, but it does so without any natural flavors, any sort of artificial flavor. Um, and so it, it's basically the healthiest sparkling beverage that you can get. It's delicious. Um, there are different uh, degrees of caffeine and different. Um, it's a product I really believe in. One of my best friends is one of the co-founders of it. He was a nuclear engineer. Him and his partner left their jobs at Indian Point to start this company. Um, and uh, yeah, you can Check them out. Drinks. Where where can you find? I'm actually. I want that right now. I'm like, where can I find that? You will. Love, I'm telling you, you. If you're like a, if you're, if you're somebody who wants something that tastes good but doesn't like sugar and wants yeah. some bubbles, it's it's so good. If you go to drinksound.com or you or you oh. you know follow them on Instagram, but you can buy yep. that. They're in a lot of Whole Foods. Um, okay. Amazon. You can go on Amazon and order it as well. Oh, um, I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, they've they've uh, they've. They're in most grocery stores in the Northeast. They've started to okay. expand like in LA, they're in Erwan. Um, yeah. but the easiest way for people across the country right now would be on Amazon. You can I'm checking it out. I have this weird thing. I always have to have some type, like I want a coffee, sparkling water. If it's night, I want a drink. Like I always, I'm going to check that Dude, out. I guarantee you, you will love it. I guarantee right. you. Boom. Done and done. I'm going to do a follow up on that one. All right. So who is someone that you professionally idolize and why? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think Joe Buck. Of Fox. Joe, that's a good one. Yeah, okay. I, I idolize him for a lot of reasons. One, uh, he's always been kind to me. Um, he's, uh, he's always, since I was 21 years old, he's been a, a champion of mine and always been kind to me. I think he is the perfect, first of all, his voice is just, you know, velvety. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's over. And the Cubs. Here's a ground ball right side, could do it. The Houston Astros are world champions for the first time in franchise history. Does the perfect job of like just capturing the moment, you know, picking the right words. I think he has humor in his broadcast, uh, mm -hmm. self-deprecation. Um, I also think, you know, he receives, 
a ridiculous amount of hate and social. Yeah, stuff. he does. And, but, but he handles it so well. Like he makes light of it. And I just admire the way he handles it. And I'm just, uh, I'm a huge fan of Joe Buck and two other people I put in there um, who have huge podcasts, Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan. I just, I just, oh, yeah. I just really admire their open-mindedness uh, and the way they kind of give experts a platform to dive into their expertise. Yeah, those are three incredible examples. The thing about Joe Buck, too, love him or hate him, he's everywhere. He finds a way to be everywhere at the biggest events, calling the biggest games, and he always does a great job at it. You think of big events, you think of his voice. Yeah, I love it. All right, give me, a, how about this one? This is a good change of pace. What job would you be horrible at? Oh, oh, anything, uh, anything fixing things. Like, I don't okay. <laughs> any kind of like, engineering or mechanic like i am like i am horrible horrible <laughs> andy at all yeah yeah god bless my fiance for having to put up with that but yeah i would be i like that question i would be awful with anything um involving having to be handy that's a good one all right this is a weird curveball here but if you could be one animal for 24 hours what animal would you be an orca i'd be an orca Whoa, what that's yeah. such confidence <laughs> I clearly have thought about this before, right? I, yeah. Um, yeah, dude. I, I love I love killer whales. Uh, I finally saw them in the wild. Actually, actually, you talk about living in Seattle. I went to San Juan Islands uh, last May. So cool. And, and finally checked them out in the wild. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just think, you know, you, first of all, you're kind of like the main predator of the ocean. Sure. You jump and frolic. You can move at incredible speeds. You're beautiful. Just oh, it like, can be great. I'll tell you, you're a salesman too, because we have never had Orca on the restart interviews. And that's a good one. I love it. All right. So this is more personalized to you. What's the most memorable play-by-play -play call you have ever had? On a game now, I would actually say that game Doris and I did, yeah. you know, the night uh, that the NBA was suspended just because of the historical context. For like one call, I would say Aaron Judge hit this home run in Seattle in 2017. And okay. he nearly left the stadium. And, um, you know, I, I just like blew a gasket call. It. <laughs> and it was just like this really genuine unbridled enthusiasm and amazement at what judge did. And I still have people to this day, like come up to me and be like, you know, I listen to that judge home run call all the time. Yeah. And, and Aaron loved it. And like, that's one that like, I, I feel great about because, um, it was like, uh, it was, you know, organic, um, and also sort of orgasmic. That is absolutely clobbered. Good gosh, where is that going to land? Oh, my, what a bomb from Aaron Judge. Testing the limits of Safeco Field with home run number 31. My reaction was like, I could not be contained. Like, I was just, I was just in pure bliss and shock. It was like, do, do you guys have like, so like when I think about a, a huge call, I think about the 1980s win over Russia. Do you believe in miracles? Yes. Do you believe in miracles? Yes. Like, is that plan? Do you have those lines ready to go? So I would say the, when I'm um, like, if I'm calling a championship yeah. or some huge moment or game that I know is coming, you know, like, Let's say the easiest example for my career is, you know, if a WNBA finals uh, could crown a champion that night, mm -hmm. I will start to think about what I want to say at the final buzzer so that day leading up to the broadcast. Sure. I won't rehearse it totally because you still have to see how the game ends and reacts. But let's say it's sort of a benign dribbling out the clock. Yeah. I usually will have two or three different things I've thought about so okay. that I can feel good about what I'm going to say. But then I'll let which one I choose be organic in the moment so that there's still some, you know, spontaneity. I love it. Oh, finally, a little inside scoop there. All right. And then the last question for Restart Rap Fire. If you were part of one TV sitcom family, what would it be? Oh, which family would that's, it be? A great, uh, that's a great That's a great question. Because I love, like, like I'm a huge like One Tree Hill, Dawson's Creek fan. Uh, oh, I like that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I've been rewatching One Tree Hill during this period of time. <laughs> nice. Uh, but I, uh, I actually think I would choose um, the Bravermans from the show Parenthood. Okay. 
Yeah, I just like I love the way they would always uh, come together and have their like family dinners outside with the they had like ex- exterior lights like outside over their dinner table. Yeah. Like um, I don't know, just something about that family. Like I feel like they were just solid and and like wholesome and and real. Like I feel like that show is the best portrayal of like um, the mundane but important realities of family life yeah. that I've ever seen. Uh, and so I think I would choose. You nailed it. Well, I am not surprised that Ryan just crushed the rapid restart. Ryan, it has been such a pleasure talking to you, get to knowing you more. I'm excited to continue to follow your story, as I'm sure everyone that's watching is. But, you know, where can we follow you to see what's next for Ryan? Yeah, man. So you can follow me um, on Twitter, uh, at Ryan Rucco, R-Y-A-N-R-U-O-C-C-O. Um, on Instagram at Rye Rooks, uh, which is R Y R U K E S, um, and uh, can um, you know be watching the Yes Network, the Zone, ESPN for the different games I do once we get sports back. But in the min- meantime, uh, you can download my podcast R Two C Two with CC Sabathia. We're recording all throughout uh, you know this quarantine period, um, and can download uh, those podcasts wherever wherever you get your podcasts. That's a beautiful thing. Awesome. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to see what's next for you and uh, continue to keep in touch. Thank you, Jason. I will. Uh, I appreciate the time, man. This was really enjoyable, man. I, I really enjoyed it and continued success to you. Thank you so much, Ryan.